but if you're here to talk about bridge scour you're in the right place if you have somehow managed to not use zoom in 2020 i will be impressed but for those that want a refresher you can mute and unmute down here in the bottom left corner and turn on and turn off your video if you want to ask a question or raise your hand, sometimes you can give a thumbs up. That's always nice to see those thumbs floating in there. Um, if you agree with something or um, you can do that right here at the participants uh, button. If you have questions, all of us are happy to answer questions throughout the presentation. So feel free to chat that in the chat box. And if we don't see it, Don will jump in and, and uh, let us know that that question came in. And then uh, at the end, you can the meeting over here in the corner. So just a quick refresher on Zoom. And as a heads up, we will be recording this presentation. It will be on the LTAC website. However, you only get credit if you participate live. So that's why Don was asking earlier, if you have multiple people in your room, you wanna make sure that she knows who all is participating because only those that participate live will get the credit. And I believe Lori said it's a quarter credit. So it all adds up. So we'll go through a few things today. I'm gonna to kick it off with some bridge conditions in Idaho, primary causes for why bridges fail, how to read your inspection reports for scour information. Scott Wood will talk about bridge foundation types and then Mike Schubert will round us out with types of bridge scour and scour countermeasures. So we're gonna kick it off with a poll question. The question is, and Don will pop this up, what grade did Idaho receive for bridges in ASCE 2018 infrastructure report card? So go ahead and take a guess. It's just like school, A is good, F is fail. How well did Idaho do? And we'll give you a minute or two to put your guess in. If you answer D, you are correct. Few, a few pessimists in the crowd, some Fs. You optimists at C. Nobody guessed A and B, so that's, I mean, everyone's on the right track. But uh, yeah, Idaho was given a D. Let's see if I can fast to the next slide. Um, there's a lot of words right there and really small. Um, we'll send out these slides if you're really interested later. There's actually a whole packet that you could look at, but some of the highlights are a lot of our bridges not nationwide, not just Idaho, are aging. Uh, a lot of the bridges were designed to be 50 years of age before replacement. Um, and 45 of our bridges, we're approaching half of all of our bridges are over 50 years old. And then today, what's especially important today is 75% of Idaho's bridges are over water. So that's why scour is an issue for most of our Idaho bridges. And of the bridges in Idaho, 208 are considered scour critical. And we'll go over what that means. So primary causes of bridge failure nationwide. So the main ones are flooding and scour. As we've seen climate change and the news, you've seen that a lot of states like Iowa and the Midwest have been having a lot more devastating impacts due to floods. Um, and then scour, kind of the same thing. It's wearing away all of the stream bed that's protecting the piers. Um, undermining, so flooding and scour contribute a large percentage of all of bridge failures nationwide. Overall deterioration, you know, just regular wear and tear on our structures. The average nationwide uh, ASCE gave a C plus rating for maintenance and safety. As you guys know, many of you maintain bridges in your own jurisdictions. It's really hard to prioritize which structures get those, uh, the dollars to help maintain your structures and keep them in good shape. So on average, our bridges are more than 42 years old. Like we said in Idaho, almost half of our bridges are getting up in age. So deterioration is something that we're watching really closely. How can we get more money for bridge replacements and bridge preservation? And then there's always design and manufacturing defects. You know, maybe the bridge was under, under designed for trucks that go over them nowadays. Uh, maybe they weren't, maybe the equipment that was used wasn't the highest quality. Um, those impact bridge failures. And then we always have natural disasters like earthquakes, fires, collisions, uh, bridges being overloaded by weight. So um, overall, this graph shows all of the statistics for bridges that failed between 2000 and 2012. And hydraulic flood and hydraulic flat scour contribute over 50% or nearly 50% of all the failures. So that's why we're trying to talk today about SCOUR, help you understand what the impacts are and why it's important to you and your structures that you maintain. 
So Idaho specific, 203 bridges are scour critical. As you can see on the map where all the red pins are, it's pretty evenly distributed throughout the state. Uh, ITD does include all of their structures that are 10 to 20 feet. Um, those are the bridges that are inspected. Uh, LTAC, we, have, we know how many bridges are between 10 and 20 feet, but we don't get bridge inspections on those. So we don't know the total number on the local system, but 203 is a big number. And uh, you can determine that whether it's um, the scour has undermined the foundation or calculations determine that. So overall, what me, what does, oh, underwater inspection. So the way that you can determine, or the way the ITD determines whether there's an issue with scour is through underwater inspections. And the minimum is every 60 months. So every 60 months, you need to have someone go under, check out what's going on under the water. ITD actually requires the scour to be done in coordination with your bridge inspection. So good bridges that aren't in risk of failure get, uh, get inspected every four years. So ITD tries to coordinate that. They sub all of that out to Collins Engineering. They don't do any of that in-house. So Collins coordinates with the bridge inspectors to see when that they're going to go out so that the work is done at the same time. So if you want to know if your bridge is scour critical, um, you can look on your inspection report. Uh, let's see if I can test the Zoom feature. Everyone give a thumbs up if you know how to find your bridge inspection reports or if you have read a bridge inspection report for your jurisdiction. Let's see if any of those are coming in. So you can, this is a, the front page of just one example. And often if you have a scour issue, the bridge inspector will put a note in each specific section where they see that there's bridge scour. And you can get a little paragraph about what they've determined and what they've noticed on site. Another place you can go to see if your bridge is scour critical is on line 113. There's an actual section that gives you a rating. And I've pulled it out what those ratings mean. If you have a three, two, one, or zero, that means we have a bridge scour problem. Um, it's a little bit different than your condition ratings. This is not tied to its actual condition. It's, um, it's more of like, how bad is it? You know, the, if you have a three, that means it's kind of a red flag. You need to start thinking about what to do. How can I replace this bridge? How can I fix it? If you are given a two, like in this bridge, example that's extensive scour that's where you need to make an, a plan of action you know what are you doing right away to mediate this scour and if it's a one that means you're probably closing the bridge to traffic and a zero means it's failed already so there's a pretty substantial drop off once you get a three to two to one uh 203 so of that number the 203 bridges in Idaho that are scour critical, that means they have a three or less on this line 113. Usually, if you have a three, two, or one on that line, a scour sketch is included in your inspection report. This is a really nice fancy one. They're not always this uh, clear and concise. Sometimes it's just a sketch, but this will help you give a little bit more information on why the bridge was given, the rating that it was given, and also helps the bridge load raters determine how much to reduce the load limit on your structure. If it's a three or a two and it's still open, you'll probably be restricting the load that can go over the bridge to make sure that we don't overload it and cause failure. So look for these if you have more questions on what's going on with the scour on your structure. Another place to look on your inspection report is line 61 and that's the channel and protection. Um, it gives you a little bit more information on, you know, what's going on with the physical conditions associated with the flow. Um, but you, I think someone else is going over this later in the presentation, but you want to make sure to keep the debris and everything around your foundations clear um, from ice backups and debris that come through. But line 61 is another place to get some information on um, scour. Like I said before, bridge calculations, the, the load raters, the people who determine what your bridge can handle, take that scour into account. So your bridge might be in good shape, you know, it might look good, the deck might be great, but if the foundation is scoured out, we will reduce the, the amount of weight that can go over the structure. So that's pretty common way 
to keep the bridge open is just reduce what can go over it, but it does restrict commerce. So if you want to know if your bridge is scour critical, we have a pretty easy place to find it. You can always look at your bridge inspection reports, but you know, maybe you've misplaced them or you're not sure where to find it. A really easy way to do that is on our LTAC bridge map. You can sort it by your county, by your city, your jurisdiction, um, get a whole list. And one of the filters in this um, bar at the bottom is scour. So right here, I just picked uh, Shoshone County and highlighted a couple. You can see what the scour rating is. You know, for example, this bridge right here was has a two. So you can pretty easily sort by all of the bridges in your jurisdiction and filter by the scour number and see how many bridges you need to look at in your jurisdiction that may have an issue with scour. So are there any questions on that so far? Feel free to type it in the chat box or just unmute yourself and pop that question in. Okay, so I'm just going to go through some aspects of the components of a bridge uh, so you get a better understanding of what exactly is happening during SCOUR. So first off, we're going to just start off with what is a bridge. Um, FHWA and ITD for local bridges define a bridge as a span that has uh, greater than 20 feet, and it's usually 20 feet between the walls. So anything less than 20 feet is not in the uh, National Bridge Inspection Inventory. So you won't get an inspection report for bridges that are less than 20 feet. But again, a lot of jurisdictions have them. LTAC's been cataloging these, and it's also important that you look to bridges under uh, 20 feet as well. Uh, some, this is one of our basic slides we've used before. It just talks about the components of a bridge. Um, the three main components are your deck. That's kind of what you see every day. Uh, your superstructure, usually consisting mainly of your girders, your beams. And then your substructure, which can include your piers, your abutments, um, and that's where your foundation, your uh, foundation scour will occur. Uh, and on foundation types, there's generally two different foundation types for bridges. Uh, one's a shallow foundation, is what we call it, and this typically consists of spread footings. Uh, GRS abutments are considered a type of spread footing, and then you know grade beams, you know just the you know two, three foot tall beams you set on the ground directly. Those are all considered shallow foundations. Uh, you can see this example down here. Here's some spread footings down here, um, kind of showing you how they bear. We'll get into this more later. And then you have the deep foundations, and these are usually piles. They can, and piles can be considered constructed of timber, steel, concrete, or even uh, another type is drilled shafts. And there are many other types of deep foundations, uh, and you can go way down a rabbit hole in this, but we'll just keep it simple for our presentation purposes. Just know that there's two different kinds of foundation types, shallow foundations and deep foundations. Um, here's a typical timber pile foundation. Uh, these are, a lot of these are in Idaho. Um, you can see this one here, they kind of protected a lot of the, uh, a lot of the timber piles with the riprap to prevent additional erosion. They actually replaced one of the timber piles with a steel pile here due to corrosion because the water eventually got over to this abutment and, and started deteriorating these piles. I talk a little bit more about the two different foundation types, the reasons why we use these foundations. Typically, if you have uh, some good soil or rock, you can use a shallow foundation. It just bears directly on, on your soil there. Uh, usually, you try to bury them uh, below your frost depth so you don't get uh, frost heave and, and movement there. But sometimes you get a layer of soil or something that's just a generally too deep and you don't want to excavate a very large hole. So then you start looking at pile foundations. Um, and these pile foundations, they basically work um, sort of mostly on skin friction for the most part, uh, some in buried as well. But so the resistance of these is, is along the length of the pile as they drive them into the ground. So what happens when you get scour? So I've got an example kind of spread footing here and there in the green is what I'm gonna call the scour here. Um, so what happens is that that area scours out and you lose a lot of the area that that foundation was burying on. Um, so as soon as it, and then you have the load on the top of the abutment, and eventually your abutment will just rock forward just like that. And typically your, your uh, superstructure will just fall down right with it or it may settle. Um, here's a pretty extreme example of one happening during a flood. Uh, you can see that that pier probably leaned over and then the span just dropped right into the river. 
Um, and this can happen any time of day. There's been several instances this happening at night and motorists just don't see them when they drive right off the bridge. Uh, here's another one, a timber crib abutment over in Bear Lake County. We're actively trying to replace right now. You can see on the left hand side here, that crib wall has actually settled quite a bit due to scour. They placed the riprap in front of it to try to slow it down a little bit. But yeah, that, that thing is settled and they just keep adding more gravel on the top to try to smooth out the surface. Uh, pile foundations also scour. You can see here, this was probably after a big flood event or could have happened over time. The original ground line was probably up here at these uh, pile collars right here. And you can see how much that scoured out there below that, those uh, collars there. Um, what happens on a pile foundation similar is you, you get the undermining under the footing. Now the bridge may stand up, but you do lose a lot of that resistance because a lot of that resistance is along the length of that pile, remember. So eventually you're your bridge will just kind of settle like this. You may have some span failure. You may have some uh, settlement issues. That can typically happen on a pile, found, pile foundation. We do like to use pile foundations when we do have scour issues on the bridge when we design. It, they typically do a little better in scour because we can account for it easier. Uh, I'm glad uh, Shoshan Howie District's on the line. I'm gonna show one of their bridges that we're gonna try to remediate the scour on. This is, uh, it looks like it's bearing on rock from the surface, but actually this was this bridge was founded on steel piles and the piles are now exposed here and they're starting to deteriorate. So we definitely want to get something done here before we have to replace the bridge just due to scour. Um, and to do a scour evaluation, there's about five things you need to know about the bridge and the and the and the river. Uh, one is the depth of foundation, whether you know whether it's founded on footings or piles um, and also the foundation geometry, how many piles they are, how, many, how big is this uh, foundation, uh, the, the materials, whether they're steel or timber or concrete, and also the foundation integrity, whether that steel's corroded or it's rotted timber, uh, cracked concrete, et cetera. So these are some important things to determine your scour evaluation on your existing bridge. However, a lot of our bridges are what we have called unknown foundations. And as Amanda pointed out to you earlier on your item number 113, your inspection report may say unknown scour. And typically what this means is um, the inspectors don't know, we don't have plans and we don't know what kind of foundation this bridge even has. So another poll question, how many of Idaho's approximately 4,500 bridges have unknown scour? Wow. <laughs> you guys are pretty pessimistic there. <laughs> the actual answer is 490. But actually, that was a pretty good guess for the majority because uh, currently there's about 580,000 bridges in the United States, and about 100,000 of those uh, do have unknown foundations. So, you know, your guess wasn't all that bad. In Idaho, we're a bit lower than the national average, but, you know, that's still not necessarily a good thing. So what can be done? Can we determine what foundations there are in these bridges, even though they're buried? And yes, you can. Um, there's basically four different methods of doing this. Uh, the first one is probing, uh, basically taking a rod or something. And the specters typically do this when they go out with some ski poles and stuff like that. They kind of probe around. And this is probably the way they do it. Um, it doesn't give you the best information. And a lot of times, you don't know if you're hitting uh, the foundation or even a rock. So sometimes it's not the best. Uh, you can go out and excavate. Um, that can be a little expensive and difficult to do because it requires big excavation, could potentially damage the foundation. Uh, you can drill, uh, do some exploratory drilling. It's pretty fast. It's a little expensive. Um, there's pros and cons to that. And there's some new techniques come along with remote sensing and stuff like that where you can instrument uh, such as a steel pile and they can uh, actually tell you how deep that pile is based off this remote sensing. I think uh, ITD has done this a couple of times here in the state and it's been pretty successful. Now that we've got that, we're gonna talk about new bridges, uh, how to design a bridge for scour. So when you're replacing a bridge, it's important to consider scour when you're going over a waterway. Some things need to be done. You need to have a hydraulic survey. We need to determine how much flow is gonna actually come through this bridge. And you may see it every couple of years be pretty high, but really we need to evaluate it. Um, ITD likes to evaluate scour on a 500 year event. Um, 
also need a geotechnical study. We need to determine what, what type of soil is down there. Um, we need to get the foundation below the scour depth. So if we say, if we predict that the scour will be three feet deep, we like to put the foundation below that three feet. And if we can't, we'll put it on piles. And then we'll also account for that additional three feet in the pile design. Um, sometimes you want to do a belt and suspenders. Most of the time you do. So even if you do put the foundation below the scour depth, you also want to provide some scour protection. So it's most of the time in here in this state, we just use riprap. And Mike Schubert later will talk about riprap. Um, it's not just cut and dry, go out there and laying riprap. You need to size it based on your flows. Also important when you design your bridge is your geometry and your layout of your bridge. Ideally, you'd like to get your super substructures out of the waterway. Uh, don't try to single span, clear the waterway as much as you can. You also want to skew the bridge with the flow. You don't want the, the uh, substructures to obstruct the flow. And also, if you do need to put a substructure such as a pier in the water, you want to make it like rounded or pointed to let the water flow around those substructures as you can. Um, some river characteristics. Ideally, this is an ideal sketch. You kind of want the bridge centered between the, between the um, stream bed there. And you want the substructures kind of out of the floodplain. And this would not restrict any of the flow. Uh, but however, none of our bridges are like that now. I'll take this example over in Lincoln County. This is over the Littlewood River. Uh, rivers change. You can't stop a river a lot of times. You can see how on this bridge, this the river just gets necked down really bad right here. And what happens is that as it gets necked down, that velocity increases and just contributes to more scour. And you can see the bends in the river. It's just a meandering river, you know. So, you know, this bridge probably needs to be a little bit longer. Uh, it's some work done to the banks, and that's what we're trying to do here for this one. This is part of our uh, bridge bundling project. Um, this is another one of uh, LTEC uh, bridge replacements on our list. This is uh, over in Blackfoot, Idaho. It goes over the Snake River, the Trust Bridge. Um, as you can see, the flow goes from the kind of the top to the bottom there. Um, however, the pier, which I represented here in green, is completely out of alignment with the with the river. What happens? This this pier um, almost kind of I would think um, I'm no hydraulic expert. I know we got a few on the phone call, but you know, potentially this pier actually pushed this main stream bed off to the right here. And actually now the abutment is starting to erode as well. And you can see this large sandbar that was created. A, a lot of people refer to that as a shadow island as the sediment comes through the river and the water kind of goes around the pier that, settle, that sediment kind of settles behind the pier there and creates an island. So a bridge can change the flow of your river. Um, another reason you want to keep substructures out of the river, debris and ice buildup. Mike will talk about later how this contributes not only to flooding, to back up water flooding, but also it can increase your velocity, increase your scour at these piers. So you want to be sure to clean that up. I know it's a pain, but it needs to be done. And with that, I am done with my section. I don't know if there's any questions right now. Yeah. What changes has ITD implemented to get the, the overall grade higher? What changes to get the grade on the bridges higher? Yes, I think we were at a D. Yeah, so right now we typically like to design bridges for a two foot freeboard clearance uh, at the at the 50 year flow. So that's the distance between the 50 year flow line and the bottom of the girder. We like to have two feet that allows for debris such as trees to flow through and then we like to clear that at the 100 year. Usually there's not a big difference between a 50 year elevation and 100 year <clears> through the floodplains, but that's typically how we, when we design new bridges, how we do it now. I know also they've been slowly shifting the amount of money that ITD spends on overall money to the state toward bridges. So the last 10 years, they've been putting more and more and more money investing in bridges, but it's such a big daunting number to catch up. It's even to move the the dial percentage point. I know they have a dashboard on the ITD website and they have metrics, you know, do we have 80% of our bridges in good or fair condition? Um, just to move that dial 1%, you know, it takes thousands and thousands of square feet of bridge deck in good condition. So they're, they have projections on how they're going to catch up, but it just takes a lot of time. And that's why LTAC and ITD are really 
working with the legislature to help give more money for infrastructure in Idaho, whether that's bridges, roads, you know, I think the number in that um, snapshot I sent said it was a $2 billion investment that was needed just for the state of Idaho to get our bridges up to good condition. So, you know, we're not going to get $2 billion. You know, we've, I think the last uh, amount of money the legislature gave us was in the hundreds of millions, but, um, you know, we need more money. And so that's where we're working with our legislative groups, the st Senate and the House Transportation Committees to help put forward bills that will give more money to ITD and to the local system because the local system is, you know, is how we have more bridges and just as many in bad shape. So um, all around more money needs to go toward bridges to bring that number up. Maybe we can have more bake sales to raise money. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> Any other questions? California, Well, up next, we're going to have Mike Schubert from HDR speak. He's a hydraulic engineer. He's going to be more technical on this subject. Uh, just um, talk more about bridge, uh, different types of scour and uh, some mediation that you can do. Thank, thank you, Scott. Again, my name is Mike Schubert. I'm a hydraulic engineer with HDR Engineering. Uh, Amanda talked uh, briefly about uh, you know, the increasing in the increases in flooding in Iowa and, uh, and the impacts it's had on the bridge system there. Uh, I spent the first eight years of my career uh, working as a hydraulic engineer uh, in the state of Iowa, doing a lot of work with the Iowa DOT and have seen uh, multiple bridges fail as a result of, of scour. So, uh, you know, certainly, certainly hits home. Um, what, we'll, uh, what I'll be talking about today, uh, four main topics. Uh, first, types of scour, really what, what are the physical causes of bridge scour, um, important consider, considerations related to identifying and mitigating bridge scour um, in, the, in the water course we're working in, uh, briefly touch on common uh, scour countermeasures, and then uh, probably most importantly provide you with a list of resources uh, you know, for your reference in, in addressing scour at uh, existing and new bridges. Uh, this is the wordiest slide I have, um, but really the, the point here is that there, is, there are a number of different causes for bridge scour, uh, from contraction of the stream uh, local to the bridge, uh, uh, acceleration and, and, uh, and turbulence near piers and abutments, uh, to uh, the scour hole on the outside bend of a river and, and, other, uh, and other geomorphic processes that work. Um, so, so bridge scour is caused by a number of processes at work at, that are all kind of playing together. Uh, another thing that's important to remember when evaluating bridge scour is that uh, the scour that's seen after a flood event is less than the maximum scour depth during the flood event. Um, you know, the nature of flood events is that they mobilize uh, sediment and gravel and at, you know, at, the, at the bed of a river. Uh, so during the peak of a flood, uh, the, the scour depth is, is actually going to be greater than what's observed in, uh, in the field after a flood, um, it, which you know, is under, under, underlines the importance of, of, of using, uh, using the bridge inspections, but also using uh, uh, scour calculations to inform decisions on uh, if, a, if a bridge uh, uh, needs a scour countermeasure. Uh, next series of slides I have here will uh, just show different uh, types of scour and, and highlight uh, you know, some of the important uh, some of the important physical processes at play. Um, this slide shows contraction scour, specifically horizontal contraction scour. So um, the top of this figure is in plan view, and the bottom is in profile. What this shows is the uh, a water course being constricted uh, in the horizontal direction, and the, the acceleration and the uh, the turbulence that results from that uh, results in two main, uh, two locations of scour holes. One that is just downstream of the uh, upstream edge of, of the bridge, which is shown in this first hole, and the second uh, just downstream of the expanded section. Uh, uh, scour occurs in these areas as a result of turbulence. That turbulence uh, gives you a, a negative pressure gradient, which is similar to, uh, similar to what makes like an airplane wing lift uh, lifts actually lifts the 
uh, sediments off of the bottom of the river in these two locations. Uh, so you know, that's important in uh, identifying well, how, how, to, how to address the scour countermeasure. Um, because those, or how to address the scour in these locations, because the scour occurs um, as a result of turbulence, anything you can do to reduce the turbulence by improving, um, by improving or uh, making your transition smoother into or off a bridge uh, will, will help uh, reduce the amount of contraction scour in the horizontal direction. Um, second, uh, second slide here shows vertical, uh, vertical contraction scour uh, that results from pressure flow. Uh, Scott had talked a little bit about uh, the design events for for clearance, you know, two foot of clearance on a 50 year event and, and uh, some clearance on a 100 year event. For scour, we're looking at a higher event and that event often will result in uh, pressure flow or overtopping flow at the bridge. Well, that, that results in a, in, a, in a vertical contraction that causes, uh, that causes a similar uh, scour hole. Uh, vertical contraction scour hole occurs near the back, you know, is greatest at the back side of a, uh, of a bridge deck. I'm getting a little bit of feedback, um, just a reminder to uh, mute, your, mute yourself on the call. Uh, the uh, next, next scour or next slide shows uh, pure scour and the mechanisms at play here. Um, so if, if, you, uh, if you spend some time in the stream uh, waiting or fishing, uh, you know, you'll see that a lot of these same hydraulics at play, uh, and you know any obstruction in a in a moving body of water, you'll have this upwelling flow and downward uh, downflow, uh, uh, highly three-dimensional velocity field. This isn't something that a one-dimensional model or even a two-dimensional model uh, simulates correctly. So we end up using uh, empirical relationships developed from research to estimate pure scour. Scour forms both on the upstream side of the pier where you have that downwelling flow, and then also on the back side of the pier, either a horseshoe or a teardrop shape um, in the weight vortex of, of the obstruction. Uh, pier shape, uh, pier dimensions, uh, you know, are, are both uh, important drivers for the I mean, ultimately the scour seen at a pier. Um, another another local scour is abutment scour. Scour hole forms on the upstream corner of the abutment. So this this figure compares on the left side uh, a vertical wall abutment, the right side is built through abutment. Uh, important things to note here is your vertical uh, wall abutments are going to have a, a sharper acceleration around the abutment. And that's going to result in a deeper or a, 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 a larger scour depth generally than a spill through abutment. And the other the other thing, uh, another thing to remember is that you know, this scour, uh, when, we're, when we're doing a scour calculation, is additive to contraction scour. So, you, so, you, so your flow contracts, and that, that contraction is seen uh, you know, through, the, through the bridge opening, and then you have this local scour that adds to that contraction scour. Um, ne next, we'll talk about a few processes at play you know, at the stream level. Um, you know, either upstream or downstream that, that could affect uh, that could affect bridge scour. In, in Idaho, we have a lot of uh, grade control structures, irrigation diversions, uh, and, and all of these have an impact on stream stability. So this figure shows uh, the progression over time that occurs at uh, at low head dam. So on the upstream side of a of a low head dam, we have uh, we have sediment deposit, and, and that sediment continues to deposit over time and and uh, you know, perhaps the, the, the irrigator you know, continues to continues to work to keep that um, uh, this diversion effective uh, so what we have is we have aggradation or uh, the bed the stream bed increases on the upstream side of a, a grade control structure on the downstream side we see degradation and that occurs because you have a you know, a hungry stream that's able to convey more sediment and it picks it up downstream. So if you have a bridge downstream of a dam or another grade control structure, uh, you would anticipate or want to look for signs of, of ongoing or long-term degradation. Levees uh, run along 
uh, run uh, along the length of a, of a river. Uh, these can influence uh, scour as well. Uh, levees will uh, will will uh, serve to uh, contain the highest velocity uh, highest velocities uh, flow in the channel during a flood event. So over time, will uh, degrade and degrade. So these two bridges uh, in this picture here, uh, especially this one, uh, you'd want to look for signs of long-term degradation as a result of river being constricted by the levee. Um, Scott, Scott and Amanda both mentioned uh, debris accumulation being uh, uh, an influence that it can worsen scour. Uh, debris ultimately blocks your flow area um, and it can cause uh, uh, higher velocities, more turbulence, and ultimately uh, deeper scour uh, at piers, abutments, and in the channel. Uh, also, debris can uh, build up um, if, it's, if this was a, a larger flood event, debris can build up along the guardrail here and force a, a, a more a more extreme uh, contraction scour as well in the vertical direction. Um, head cutting is something that occurs, and you want to take a look, want to look out for. Um, a specific concern here in Idaho would be uh, you know, uh, pit capture after a, or a, you know, the effects of pit capture. Uh, if, a, if a gravel pit wall were to fail or, or if there's another uh, event that causes our instability to migrate upstream, uh, that could cause degradation at a bridge at that area. Um, so, so, how do we, so how do we go about uh, you know, developing uh, uh, scour countermeasures? Well, it's, you know, as Scott mentioned, it's not, it's not you know, simple and straightforward. There's not a one-size-fits-all uh, approach to this. Uh, there are uh, three manuals that uh, FHWA has put out that outline in, in great detail. Uh, you know, the steps you take basically uh, follow this top flow path here. You, you evaluate your stream stability, where your bridge is. You evaluate the hydraulic situation of the bridge as it relates to scour, and then develop your scour countermeasure. So as I said, again, there are uh, a number of uh, manuals available, HEC, eight, uh, HEC 20, HEC 18, HEC 23. So this is, uh, HEC 23 actually has two volumes. Um, Maybe, maybe one of the more helpful parts of HEC 23 is, is this uh, countermeasures matrix. And it, um, it, looks, uh, it, it looks daunting at first, but it's pretty helpful. Uh, different scour countermeasures are shown on the left-hand side as rows, and then applications and suitable environments are shown uh, as columns. So if, you want to know, if you're trying to figure out how to address scour, this is a good place to start. Identify the type of scour, the environment, and uh, and this, this matrix can, uh, can help guide uh, decisions uh, in that direction. A couple uh, common scour countermeasures. Uh, first, we talked a little bit about uh, uh, riprap protection and abutments. Um, this is common, we see this. Um, we often see this. Uh, there are guides for uh, sizing your, your riprap based on uh, your D50 or your, your median diameter of uh, riprap. A couple important things to note. Uh, if you go back, if you think back to that first figure I showed of, of, of uh, horizontal contraction scour, there is a secondary scour hole down, uh, downstream of the bridge. Um, to, to mitigate against this, when we're uh, putting, a, putting riprap protection around an abutment, we want to make sure that Again, so in this diagram here, flow is moving from the right to the left. We want to make sure that we wrap this riprap back around the abutment, either to um, a depth of two times the flow or 25 feet, uh, whichever is greater. And that gives us enough coverage that if uh, a scour, uh, if a scour hole were to form here, um, if that riprap could could uh, would would have a chance of protecting the the bridge abutment. Another important thing when we're doing these scour, or scour uh, protection is protection at the toe. Um, you know, the bottom of the channel or the toe of the channel you know, experience some, some of the highest um, shear stresses. So we want to make sure that we have uh, adequate, uh, adequate design of, of the bottom of that riprap. Um, as you can imagine, if, if the bottom isn't, isn't uh, put in correctly and designed correctly, 
uh, that undermines and uh, the, the whole riprap blanket can go with it. Um, and then uh, when, we're protect, when we're protecting our, our peers, um, a couple things to note uh, is that you know, how far should you go out uh, the guide in half 23? It starts with take a look at your peer width, go out to two times that peer width, and that should be the, the dimension that we're looking to extend uh, the, the peer, uh, peer protection out. Uh, another important thing is, has to do with placement. For a long time, it, you know, it was kind of just place riprap at the surface or inside the scour hole. Um, at, you know, by placing riprap at the surface, we're actually increasing the velocity that that riprap sees and, it, and as a result, increasing the likelihood that that riprap undermines. Uh, the, the preferred method for doing it if possible is to bury that riprap protection uh, you know, at a depth so that um, you know, when, when scour does occur, this riprap protection doesn't undermine. And, and then lastly, uh, talking about uh, you know the larger situation uh, protecting against uh, degradation or uh, slope failure in the channel, uh, grade control structures. You know, you know low, you know, low uh, grade control structures would be one way that we stabilize the channel uh, in the vertical direction and then horizontally. Uh, bank stabilization, similar to a rip trap uh, blanket at our abutments, can be used. Um, th there's, a, there's a lot of focus right now on using uh, bioengineering or green, green stabilization, which is the use of, of, of plantings or other biological techniques to, to reinforce the stream bank. Um, that can be a, a low cost way that also has a, an environmental benefit uh, to stabilization. Uh, but it's important to note that. Uh, Federal, high, federal highways manuals are, are pretty explicit that um, that you know that those can be used for stream stabilization but shouldn't be used for abutment protection so um, you know we still want to use hard armored solutions uh, we still want to use hard armored solutions at our bridges and then lastly uh, just a quick list of resources a lot of these were referenced throughout the presentation um, the different manuals that uh, FHWA has out HEC 18, uh, HEC 20, HEC 23. Scott mentioned the design of safe bridges, ITB's roadway design manual. Uh, they're actually going through the process of updating the hydraulic manual right now, so that will uh, that should have even better information. And then uh, these two reports uh, that address specifically effects of debris and uh, counter scour countermeasures at piers. And, and with that, I'll, I'll uh, turn it back over to Scott to talk about uh, applications of or bridge, bridge failures and uh, applications uh, here in Idaho. Scott? Thanks, Mike. Uh, do we have any questions on what Mike presented on? I don't see any in the chat session, but I'm just going to see if anybody wanted to speak out loud here. I'm going to just kind of finish this off here, um, talk a little bit about some more scour prevention and repair. Uh, a lot of times, the Repair recommendations will be listed in your inspection report. There is a section on your inspection report for repair recommendations, um, not only including scour, but other items as well. So, you know, read your inspection reports. Again, we're just going to beat that into your head as much as we can. Uh, look for potential issues when you're out there. You know, Mike gave some great examples of how scour occurs. So when you're out there, look for those potential issues and try to mediate those as soon as you can. You can make this part of your bridge maintenance, hopefully your yearly bridge maintenance. Uh, Amanda and I have given pres presentations before on bridge maintenance and we're gonna pound it into everybody's head until they start doing it every year. Um, ask for help. Uh, there's lots of resources out there. Your consulting friends can help, we can help, we can direct you to the, to the right direction on that. Um, and also fix it soon. As you can tell by a lot of Mike's presentation, it's, it's, it's a gradual change. So the sooner you can fix it, the better you'll be. If it gets too large, it's gonna just be, either it won't be able to be fixed or it'll be just too difficult to fix. And these aren't always expensive things to fix. They can be low cost solutions such as riprap, which is fairly cheap. Um, here's an example of a fairly cheap one. Um, I believe Amanda worked with Washington County on this one to construct a concrete footing apron. I believe they did this with their own forces. The 
The picture on the left is shows, if you look below that footing, you can see the water getting under that foundation there. So they just went in when the water was low and constructed this uh, concrete footing apron around there. Um, very common one is just to place more riprap. Um, again, it's not as simple as just picking something and laying it out there. It does need to be calculated so that the, that the riprap itself doesn't get washed away. So you'll have to um, get some help with that. Also, don't just go in a river and start digging up and placing stuff. If, if it's just basic minor maintenance stuff, that's probably okay. But if it gets too major, you might want to give Carissa or Joellen a call um, over here at LTAC. They can help you out. There's lots of ever-changing environmental regulations. This is just a little snippet. Um, it's not so bad if it's a non-federal aid project. Uh, the Army Corps can help you out. But depending on your river type, uh, it does require some environmental clearances and some environmental work. Um, and this, this, there's a lot of words in this slide, but if you get a copy of this later, it can help you. But again, call Carissa or Joel, and they're a great resource. Like I said, the laws are always changing, and they can get you in contact with the right people as well. So just to summarize this whole presentation up, uh, read your inspection reports for scour issues. There's very detailed information in there on that. Um, and identify the scour issues yourself. You know, look for the potential issues, the backwater, the holes that are forming. You know, look at your channel banks and how the rivers are flowing around your bridge. Uh, understand how your bridge is affected by your scour. Uh, do you have spread footings? Do you have pile footings? Do you not know? Uh, you know, can it be determined? And again, repair the scour issues early. It's going to be cheaper if you get it early. Um, and also make scour identification and repair as part of your maintenance plan. Hopefully you can come up with your maintenance plan for all your bridges and uh, make that part of your maintenance, maintenance plan to look yearly or you know, every five years, maybe do some scour mediation around your district. Um, if you have any questions, Feel free to call us um, or email us. I'll leave this up for a few minutes in case we got anything, or you can just pop in a question. Uh, if you need to reach me or Amanda, it's the same LTAC number. We may not be in the office right now, but you can certainly be reached. And I think that's all we have. Do we have any questions? Uh, Don put the LTAC phone number up there um, on the chat session, and Mike. Might do the same for his. I have a question. Sure. What's why is it a 50-year cycle for these bridges? That seems awfully short. I mean, obviously, there's money involved, but isn't it cheaper to build them better and to last longer? I, it's just a question of risk. Uh, you know, they say it's a 50-year storm, which really what Mike is a two percent chance of happening, right? That, that's right. So yeah, 50 year storm is yeah, right. 2% annual chance. So, you know, risk versus reward. How much do you want to spend? Sure. You can design a bridge to withstand hurricane force flooding, but what's it going to cost you? So there has to be some sort of happy medium there as to what you can actually construct it for and consider the cost. Well, and, and Scott, as I mentioned, the scour design event is, is, typically larger than the hydraulic design events. So, you know, we're, we're looking at the 50 and 100 year events for, for clearance and for flooding. Um, you know, we want our bridge to stand up to a, that larger, you know, 500 year event you know, that causes pressure flow. So, so, so when we're, when we're looking at designing a new bridge um, or, or at, at, or at an existing bridge, we want to evaluate, we do want to evaluate a higher, uh, higher magnitude event for scour than, than just for hydraulic clearance. Thanks. So are we still building them for a 50 year lifespan? And bridges are designed for a longer, I mean, it's intended and expected to last longer, especially now, um, we doesn't mean we expect it to fall over in 50 years. It just means, um, you know, you probably need to invest in maintenance to keep it going longer. I mean, we do not have the money to replace half of our bridges in Idaho. And when they reach 50 years old, you know, we barely have enough money to replace I mean, I think we get two or three a year with our local funds for bridge replacements. So um, that's where it's just at that age, you need to start, you know, it's middle-aged. It needs a little, needs a little medicine, needs a little help, needs uh, to be, you know, looked at a little.
little bit more closely. Um, you know, I don't think anyone's expecting it to just fall down at age 50 years or 51 years. You know, that's obviously not going to happen. But, um, you know, that's just to keep in the back of your head, you know, and we're, we are trying to design it for longer lifespans as, as we see that we don't have enough money to replace it all. But um, it just happened in the 50s that we just invested a lot of money in infrastructure and a lot of those bridges are all getting old at the same time. So how can we keep them going without another huge in, uh, investment in infrastructure? Um, and maybe we do need another big investment in infrastructure. And that's what we're working at, at the local state level. And then again, at the national level, how can we, you know, nationwide, our bridges are a C plus. So, um, you know, it's not just Idaho that's dealing with this issue. It's how can we get more money? How can we preserve our good bridges longer so that we can replace the ones that are scour critical, that are structurally deficient, um, undersized, you know, there's bridges that are doing fine, but they can't carry the loads that they're carrying now with our mega loads that we're driving across them. So um, it's a little bit of a multifaceted problem, but at the end of the day, we need our bridges to last longer than 50 years. And keeping track of our scour critical ones and taking care of them before they hit a two and dip below a three, that's where it's going to be really important for you guys to look at your inspection reports and take care of the scour. Well, it's an easier problem before it becomes a one or you have to close the bridge. And the, the current ASHTO code, if it's a new bridge, states it needs to be in service for at least 75 years. So looking at deterioration of the structural components is a big one. And we typically try to design for 75 years design life. Typically, if you're designing for 75 though, you'll probably last a lot longer than that. Mm -hmm. um, I believe Art had a question on here. Uh, you mentioned environmental documents. When will one be needed? Uh, when in doubt, I'd still call Carissa, but I think in general, if you're looking at working within the ordinary high water, which is typically a pretty well-defined line, you know, vegetation kind of, you can kind of look at a river and tell how high your water gets every year. So typically if you're under the ordinary high water mark, which is a typically, I believe, a two year flow, I believe is what I would kind of a rule of thumb. Um, typically that's when you definitely need a permit, um, but you know, always call Carissa or Joelle and they can help you out with that art. The shorter answer is we don't know. <laughs> that's, that's why we have environmental experts. They're all different. Yeah, every, you know, depending on if it's the water of the US, if it's an irrigation, irrigation, you know, they're all different. So definitely. And the laws are always changing. It's a moving target. Any other questions? I think we're right on time. Appreciate everybody attending.